Hi, and welcome to tonight's event, How to Make College More Affordable. I'm your host, Katie Stanfield, Executive Director of Social Marketing at Kaplan. Before we get started tonight, I have just a few housekeeping notes to review. First of all, the session will be about an hour long and we'll be taking questions throughout the hour. So thanks to you who submitted questions in advance. We have them and we've worked them into a lot of the presentation you'll see tonight. Because of the number of families watching this evening, we're gonna keep the information more general in nature. We'll also share some helpful links and resources throughout tonight's session so that you can develop the best possible plan for your family. And then a quick orientation to YouTube chat. There's a live chat function to the right of the video on the default view. So please post any questions or comments that you may have there. We have Kaplan moderators standing by who will answer or send them over to our panelists. This session is also being recorded. You can access this session as well as past sessions right here on our YouTube channel. And if you haven't already, please connect with us on social. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, when your child is focused on getting into college, many of you, and myself included, I've got two young children, uh, we're thinking about how to pay for college. There's scholarships, there's different types of aids, there's FAFSAs to complete, expected family contributions. It can all be really tricky to keep track of what it all means and what you should do and how you might go about creating a plan that works for your family. Um, we are very fortunate tonight to be joined by Monica Felton and Kate Janica, Janicki. Um, we're gonna meet them now. Monica is the founder and president of the Elliott Group, a financial planning firm based in Arizona. And Monica's financial planning practice focuses on helping families um, save and pay for college so that they don't sacrifice their retirement. We had many of you ask questions about that, of what about my retirement? What does that mean? So we're gonna answer those questions for you tonight. And Kate Janicki is a principal of Notre Dame Academy, which is an all girls Catholic school in Staten Island, New York. So Monica, let's get started by getting some sticker shock out of the way. Can you walk us through the average tuition at public and private schools? Yeah, so there's a terminology and it's called cost of attendance. And there's really three different types of schools. The first is what we call your public schools, your state public schools. And those are running about $27,500 a year. And then we have those private schools or out of state public schools. Those ring in at about $57,000 a year. And then if you have those Ivy, baby Ivies or very elite schools, now we're upwards of around $72,000 a year. Now, most families are thinking, oh my gosh, that's so expensive. I didn't know tuition was that high. But the reality is, is the cost of college is far more than just tuition. It's books, room and board, incidentals, et cetera. And so this cost of uh, attendance is really that all-inclusive sticker shop, or sticker price. Now, one thing I do want to add, uh, not to make matters worse, but just to help be more realistic, is that these costs are inflating at 5% each year and have been doing so for about 20 years. So uh, it's usually when families see that big sticker price uh, that they, you know, uh, start looking for financial aid and other things. But, um, and I'm going to let Kate speak to this as well. The reality is, is that this sticker price or cost of attendance is, is not always what families will pay, but it is the sticker price. It's the initial place that we start for college. And then there's a lot of ways to tackle that cost uh, as we proceed. So we got many questions about aid. Um, and ways that you can reduce the cost of college and to your point, like reduce it from sticker price down to something that may feel a little bit more manageable for families. Uh, so can you give us a brief overview of merit versus need based? Absolutely. Different? Absolutely. So when you're looking at financial aid, there's really two types of financial aid. There's merit based aid, which is based on your students academics. And then there's need-based aid, which is based on mom and dad's economics. So merit and need are obviously very different ways that you can lower the cost. Now, merit, again, is your students' academics or athletics, or if they have some unique attribute that schools are really looking for, uh, that's that piece. Um, and then need, again, is, is based on mom and dad's economics. 
So we have several more slides to support the, you know, how do you figure out from a need perspective how much families will actually have to pay. And there is a specific formula that the government uses to determine aid eligibility for families. Um, but I think we should spend just a small amount of time talking about merit and, and you know, what that looks like and how families could be eligible because, again, you can have a family that makes millions of dollars, but their, their, their student is still eligible for merit type financial aid. That's a great point. Monica. Kate, what have you seen in your experience based aids for families um, who may not qualify for need-based aid? Um, many of our students at our high school, Notre Dame Academy, do uh, receive merit scholarships to a broad range of colleges by virtue of their, their talent, mainly their academic talent, um, their scores on the ACT or the SAT, their GPA, the strength of their schedule, how many AP courses they're taking. All of those things factor into a college's decision when making the initial offer for a merit-based scholarship. And we do see the students um, doing very well with those private schools um, and getting initial offers that are very generous from the colleges and the parents are quite pleased. And many times, um, they will, after their first initial offer, uh, find out that there, there are more talents that the student has and they're able to get additional scholarship or merit-based money from that school to bring it down to a price that's, like you said, more manageable than the original the sticker price. That is great. And I'm sure um, many families will be excited to learn more. And we will talk more about scholarships in addition to the various types of aids as we work through tonight's session. Um, Kate, also, what are some of the common challenges that you hear from families when it comes to paying for college, generally speaking? I think there's, um, you know, around junior year, there's always the initial kind of hesitation. How are we going to pay for this? And hopefully parents um, and families are beginning to think about it before junior year, as early as freshman year. And hopefully eighth grade, they're starting to have a conversation about what, um, what type of financing the family has available, how much they've saved, how much they can contribute, and what the expectation is for the student. The better the student does academically from the very first year of high school, the better positioned that student will be when it comes time to college applications at the very beginning of senior year. So um, the initial concerns are, how do I fill out the FAFSA? I think they get overwhelmed by that. And I guess Monica is going to talk about that shortly. Um, and then once they attend the meetings, I encourage all the parents to go to all the meetings that the schools offer, listen to the financial advisors, um, read as much as you can. They begin to become more at ease because knowledge is power, right? That's exactly right. And, and we're going to drop some knowledge tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so Monica, I'm gonna flip back to you. We received okay. quite a few questions from families who are concerned about household income. And I know you're about to talk about expected family contribution, um, but what that means for when it comes to qualifying for aid, is there an income level above which a student is no longer eligible for need-based aid? You know, I every single family is different, right? Because, uh, and if we wanna to go to the next slide, there's, there's really seven factors that are used to determine a family's need-based aid eligibility. And it's mom and dad's assets, mom and dad's income, mom and dad's age, students' assets and income, number of family member or number of people in the household, and number of students going to college at the same time. So you can see there are a number of different factors and I don't want families only focused on income. Now, what is going to help you understand your aid eligibility is a term called expected family contribution or EFC. Your expected family contribution is the amount of money that the government says that you can afford to pay per year to educate one child. And so this just gives you a baseline of what you can be expected to pay. So all of you on this call should be able to figure out what the government thinks you should have to pay for college. Again, this is barring any type of merit awards. This is just need. So the first piece of calculating your expected family contribution is we're gonna look at the parents' side of the house. And so we're gonna look at parents' income. And your income is inclusive of everything. So to look at it a different way, 
It's your adjusted gross income on your tax return, adding back any contributions that you've made to a 401k, an IRA, a pension plan, an HSA. So you're going to add all those numbers up. And then you're going to multiply that times 25%. Then they're going to look at a family's assets. An asset includes everything with the exception of uh, cash value, life insurance, annuities, or money already in an IRA, a pension, or a 401k they're going to calculate it that 6%. So just to do some easy math, if I'm a family and I make $100,000 a year and I have $100,000 of visible assets, the government is going to say that I can afford to pay about $30,000 a year to educate one child. Now, we're not done at that equation. They're also going to look at the student side of the house. Remember, we're going to look at students' assets and income. So if you have a student that's making some income, and I'm not talking about working at Starbucks or anything like that. I always encourage students to work in, co in high school. Um, but I'm talking about if you have a computer whiz or somebody, you know, a child that's making upwards of six, seven thousand dollars a year that can reduce need-based financial aid because they assess that at 50% on the student side of the house. They're also gonna look at students' assets. And a student asset is anything like a UTMA account or a UGMA account. These are custodial accounts that maybe families or grandparents have created for their student. Um, these, again, can be highly punitive for a family that's going to be eligible for need-based financial aid. So if you're a family who will be eligible for need-based financial aid, what we do is we will shift assets from the student side of the house back over to mom and dad. Now, again, a fi I get this question all the time, a 529 a college savings plan is a parent asset. It is not a student asset. So those actually are calculated at that 6%. So it's usually at this time when parents start having a panic attack because they're realizing, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to pay something. And usually the numbers are pretty big for college. But what I tell families is don't fear we need to understand earlier rather than later, are you going to need to be a need-based family, which means you're going to be eligible for need-based financial aid, or are you going to be going it on your own? If you're going to have to go it on your own, there are other strategies that we can employ, tax-based strategies, where we actually can send money that we've been sending to the government for tax purposes, we can repurpose that over to the schools. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of ways to chip at this cost of college, but you have to have an awareness of what type of family you're going to be, a need-based uh, family or a tax-based or more efficient strategy-based uh, type of family. So Monica, quick question. Do you ever shift or recommend families shift assets to some of those protected categories so that it reduces the burden or reduces the percentage or the amount of money that is coming from income and assets? Well, and we'll get to this later. I only recommend that families do something that financially makes sense for the health of the family. I would never recommend a family repurpose just to become more need eligible. Uh, and we'll talk about this later. It is the school's decision that your student ultimately goes to how they're going to meet need. So just because you have need doesn't mean a school is going to fill it. So first and foremost, we always want to make good financial decisions that will benefit the family. Secondly, is there a way to make you more need-based or need-eligible? That is, uh, we would look at that second. That's great. And we have a question coming in from our viewers right now. So a question from Madeline. Are these calculations per year or total for four years of college? 
Oh, thank you for asking that. This is per year. So when we go and fill out the FAFSA form, you fill out the FAFSA every single year that you're looking for aid. So, um, uh, yeah, so an expected family contribution is based on what you're supposed to pay per year per child. That's very helpful. Uh, there's so much to do over those four years, and I imagine that these numbers can change pretty dramatically. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the cost of attendance and what all is wrapped up in the total amount of money that, that we're spending for our college education. You want to break that down for us a little bit? Um, well, actually, if we might, let's pop over to the next slide, which talks about, you know, how you get your need filled. So remember, the expected family contribution is what you're required to pay um, or expected to pay, I should say. So the equation to get your need met looks like cost of attendance. And remember, that's that sticker price. Every school has one. Then you're going to subtract out your personal expected family contribution. So whatever's left over, that is need. So that's what a family will be eligible for. Um, and like I said, uh, well, need-based aid is what a family can get or how much help they can get. And I, I want to make it clear that who determines how to meet the need is the school that your student ultimately attends. So I will say this again, just because you have need doesn't mean the school is going to fill the need. So I encourage all of my families and for everyone on this call today, go home, tell your kids to study hard and get good grades because grades are the biggest financial impact that can be made on the cost of college because you can have 100% need and a student that's a CD student and no school is going to help you because again, schools, are, schools entice families to come based on how badly they want the student. And that looks like, if I want you to come to my school, I'm gonna give you money to entice you to come to my school. So I, you know, getting back to your original point of do we make financial changes um, to make families more need eligible? Well, again, only if it makes financial sense because the school is going to determine how much need they fill for each family. Well, that's a great point. And um, yes, grades, right? So making sure that the student is going to stay in college and be successful in college, right. I imagine, is a big part of the school awarding aid to those students. Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to rewind just a little bit. When we talked about parent assets, you talked about 529s. We get a lot of questions about 529s. They know you do too. Um, and so what if the 529 is in the grandparent's name? Is that still counted as a parent asset? Is it counted as a student asset or is that completely separate? So that would be, so for the FAFSA, that would be invisible. So if the grandparents own the 529, then that would not be reported up on the FAFSA. But here's the challenge, and I caution many families about these 529 in grandma and grandpa's name. So if grandma and grandpa decide to spend the 529 by giving the money to the school, which is what you do, then it looks like a gift to the student and it becomes a student asset. And if you remember, students' assets are highly punitive when you're eligible for need-based financial aid. So if you're not going to be eligible for need-based financial aid, quite frankly, it doesn't matter who owns the 529. But if you are eligible for need-based financial aid and, and grandma and grandpa start spending down that 529 and sending checks to the school, that is a gift to the student and an asset and it could reduce your aid. I'm sure that a lot of this has been thought through and that's part of how this gets into the rules. Um, so we're going to talk about FAFSA in more detail next. Um, one of the many questions that we got about FAFSA was we had several questions saying, do we even need to fill out the FAFSA? Kate, how do you coach families at your school? Yes, fill out the FAFSA because you never know um, what could change and um, it's free. 
Uh, so what is there to lose by filling out the FAFSA? And it doesn't take that long. I think sometimes people get confused and Monica, you'll probably talk about the difference between the FAFSA and the CSS profile. Mm -hmm. um, but the FAFSA, if you really sit down and devote the time and have your paperwork ready, it should take less than an hour, I think, to complete it, if I'm right about that. So uh, I say fill it out. It's worth it. It's free. Monica, I don't know if you agree with that or have anything to add. Well, I think if you're a fan, well, let me let me back up by saying if you at all, if you want any type of help, even loans like student loans or parent loans, you will be required to fill out the FAFSA. So it, you might be a family who makes a half a million dollars a year and you want your kids to get student loans because you feel that would be a good way for your kids to have skin in the game and maybe teach some financial literacy. Uh, you know, which I highly encourage, um, you would still have to fill out the FAFSA to get student loans. Even though you would never be eligible for need-based financial aid, you still have to fill out the FAFSA if you want student loans or parent loans. Now, again, you can do the math very quickly yourself. So today, the most expensive college we have is $75,000 a year. Well, if you make $300,000, that means that your expected family contribution is going to be $75,000 a year. So in that instance, you would not be eligible for need-based financial aid. So if you're not looking for aid and you're not looking for student loans, I likely would say don't fill out the FAFSA. So only in very specific situations, uh, which makes sense, but right. there may be other reasons and plenty of other reasons to fill out the FAFSA. And again, this is an annual thing, so it may not make sense in one year, but it may make sense in another year. Right. And again, we, we, spoke, we talked a little bit, your expected family contribution is going to look different if you have one child in as compared to two kids in college at the same time. So a family that might not be eligible for need-based financial aid with only one student in college, when the second student goes into college, you might now be eligible for need-based financial aid. So I just really encourage families, the sooner the better. And for me, I, I always say parents should start planning for college when their babies are in the womb and the next best time is today. So you don't have to wait until high school to figure out really what you're going to be expected to pay because once you have those numbers, you can begin planning for this. Imagine if you knew you were going to have to spend $100,000 on college and you started planning when your kid was in the fifth grade how much more success would you have with that piece of preparation than waiting until their junior year? Great advice, start early. Um, so I think that's, that's one of our big takeaways to everyone watching is start early. So right. let's dig into the FAFSA a little bit more. Monica, okay. will you walk us through what all is involved here? Yeah, so the FAFSA again is the free application for federal student aid. You can, uh, there's no cost to complete it, and many, many of these are filled out every single year. Now, you, you fill out the FAFSA your student's senior year. You can start doing it October 1st. Um, now, the financial information that you're going to use for that FAFSA would actually, we have a new terminology, it's called prior, prior. And so I'm going to explain that a little bit more in just one second. But what I want families to understand is there's a very high audit rate on FAFSA forms. And FAFSA is not audited by the government or the IRS. They're audited by the schools in which your students are uh, applying to. And so what will happen is you'll submit the FAFSA in. And then they might call you back up and say, look, now we need your actual tax returns, brokerage accounts, et cetera. So that's an audit, so to speak, when they begin requesting all the information that you've submitted on the FAFSA. Now, historically, there have been a lot of errors on the FAFSA, but we believe that this change, and if we can flip to the next slide, um, which is called the prior prior, will will really reduce a lot of the errors. So 
the financial information that the FAFSA is going to be using is actually two years prior to when your student actually goes to college. So in the example I've given here, if you have a student going to college in 2020, you're going to fill out your FAFSA form October 1st of 2019. And then the tax return that you will be populating that FAFSA with is from 2018. So what you can see is most families will have their tax return already completed, and then we can just upload the information directly from the IRS website. Uh, so we believe that this change with the financial data being prior prior will really help uh, reduce a lot of the errors that we have historically seen on that FAFSA form. So there's a couple of changes then to FAFSA. So one of those is making the FAFSA available earlier. So this was Correct. a pretty recent switch of moving it to October 1st. Kate, have you seen from your families in your high school any shift in behavior? Do you see any benefits for people who fill it out earlier? Or do you still see people waiting kind of until after the new year to begin filling it out? No, they, they were waiting uh, end of September. They were waiting for it to open. And I think you can fill out your um, FSA ID. You can get the FSA ID uh, before it opens on October 1st. And it takes a few days to process that num your FSA ID mm -hmm. that you'll need to fill out the FAFSA. So our parents this year were, they all had their FSA ID and they were ready to go October 1st um, to start completing it because they had the tax, uh, they had the tax forms from the prior prior, like my Monica said. So um, I think, I think, yeah, we, we keep saying earlier is better, but we don't want people to panic if they didn't do it yet, because I think they have all the way until June, right, to, compl to, to complete it. But right. um, people are doing everything earlier these days, it seems to me, and uh, they, they were ready to get going right away this year. Well, and I have to say, as a planner, as a financial planner, I'm thrilled that they're pushing these uh, fi the financial information earlier and earlier, because if you just do the math really quick, families who are, you know, the, the second semester of your student's sophomore year and the first semester of your student's junior year, that's the tax return that they're going to use. So families really should have a solid understanding of what type of family are you going to be? Are you going to be eligible for need-based financial aid? How much is college really gonna cost me? We should know these things your students sophomore year because obviously that's the planning or that's the year that we're gonna use to determine the next four years of aid eligibility for your student. So I'm thrilled that we're getting earlier and earlier with this planning. Yes, that is great. And as someone who is often files past April 15th, my husband's an entrepreneur, it is nice to have the shift to prior prior because that, that sure makes it easier to have all of that ready to go once the window opens. Right, right. I also wanted to comment on the CSS profile because almost all schools are going to require a FAFSA, but there's a few schools that will require the CSS profile. And the CSS profile, there's really about, I wanna say 215. These are your Ivy, your baby Ivy, your very elite and prestigious schools that will require a CSS profile as well as the FAFSA. The CSS profile is a much more invasive financial, uh, inform they request more financial information. And to give you an example, home equity is not included in the FAFSA as an asset to help pay for college. But on the CSS profile, they do look at home equity as an asset to help pay for college. So there are some very large differences. The other piece about the CSS profile is there is a cost to register, and then there is a cost for each school that you want to send that to. So again, it's a much more evasive or invasive form financially to families. Um, but you know, of the over 4,000 four-year universities in this country, only about 225 or 215 actually will require the CSS profile. 
So Monica, out of curiosity, in addition to home equity as an asset, is there anything else that is specific um, that falls under the institutional methodology? Is like yes. what, else, what else does that include? Yes, another big deal for you know families like yourself, whose husband's an entrepreneur, is the FAFSA does not look at business assets if a company has 100 employees or less. The CSS profile will look at company assets. So that is a big difference for families who, you know, are self-employed or have a real estate empire or things like that. So I think that between the, the home equity and um, the business assets, that's a really big difference between the two. Yes, that makes a huge difference for families, I imagine. Um, Absolutely. If you have specific questions about the CSS profile, Monica, where can families get more information? On the CSS profile? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, one of my favorite websites is collegeboard.org. Um, that is really a holding place for all the universities in this country and basically looks at the requirements to get in, how much the schools cost, what financial forms they're looking for, uh, so it is just a wealth of knowledge. So for anyone who's considering college, that should definitely be a website that goes on your favorites, um, at least until you go or, you know, are accepted into college. Yes, let bookmark, bookmark all the websites and we're going to share a few more with you just a minute. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, so if you've just joined our live stream, welcome. Uh, we're here with college financial expert Monica Felton and high school principal and parent Kate Janicki, understanding ways to make college more affordable. This is recorded, so you can rewind and start at the beginning if you've missed anything. We've talked about the FAFSA. We've talked about expected family contribution. We've talked about the price of college and, um, and different types of aid available. So we what we haven't talked about yet and yet what we got many questions about were scholarships. Um, so in addition to merit-based aid and need-based aid, we know many families are exploring scholarships, but you had many questions about them and it can feel a little overwhelming. Um, we've had many parents tell us before, like I go to start looking at them and it just feels like there's a whole lot and I don't know where to start. So Kate, when do you advise families at your high school to start researching and applying for scholarships and what should the role of the student be in all of this? Well, I think the parents and the students should have the conversation. They should be researching scholarships um, together. And the parent should, if the parent expects the student to be working towards these scholarships, um, they should have that conversation with them and, and explain exactly what that expectation is. And students can, you know, begin by asking your counselor because the college counselors have so much information coming to them via email on a daily basis. And in our school, our college counselor uses a Google Classroom platform where she posts all the scholarship opportunities that come into her and almost daily she's updating that. And then every week or so she'll send, um, you know, a list or she'll post like a longer list of all of these um, uh, different opportunities. Um, and then these are two great sites that you have up, Unigo and FastWeb, which are just clearing houses for tons and tons of scholarships. And they're both really friendly, um, especially Unigo is really student friendly. I think the students tend to enjoy that site very much and it's easy to search in there and they can find something that would uh, speak to their specific talents because there's a scholarship for almost everything out there. But they involved a little bit of work. You know, you have to submit some paperwork, letters of recommendation. Often you have to write another essay and they're writing lots of essays right now. But um, I think we were, we were just talking about this the other day and saying, um, so if you had to sit down and write an essay for, you know, an hour and a half or two hours and you had a chance of earning $1,500, would that be worth an hour? What else can you do? You know, where else can you earn $1,500 in an hour and a half to two hours? So if you put it that way, maybe there's a little bit more incentive to work on that extra essay. That's right, that's a fantastic return on investment of time. Mm -hmm. um, so Kate, uh, also we had lots of questions come in about national scholarships and where to find these. And we've shared some websites where people can find scholarships all over the country. Um, but I know you mentioned to us recently that many of your students have found success with local scholarships. Can you tell us a little bit more about yeah, those that are available? Yeah, definitely. I think it's important that you become aware of what kinds of scholarships are available in your specific community. We have a lot of community-based organizations that are looking to recognize students in their senior year for service contributions, for academic excellence, and they do reach out to the schools and, you know, you keep a list of those from year to year 
and you make sure that you um, you know follow up on those. We had one one organization last year contacted us, and they were looking specifically for students who were uh, female students going into engineering. So we had two girls who were going to Virginia Tech. They were already accepted. They already had their their financials in order for that. And um, we told them, hey, th you know, this seems to fit your, um, your background. And they both applied, they had to write another essay, they submitted the essays, letters of recommendation went in and sure enough, they both won awards. I think the awards were you know, $1,500 to $2,000. They were honored at a luncheon, their parents got to come, everybody felt great. And that was money they hadn't been counting on. So this process can continue throughout the senior year by looking for these organizations that are um, within your community, small, you know, somewhere between 500 to 2000 or up to $3,000 scholarships. You go for a few of those and that really can be a significant um, addition to your package. Yeah, that, those really add up. If you got several of those, those could start to make a big dent. And I imagine there's also less competition for some of the local scholarships as compared to some that you may find on broad, wide ranging websites. And when a, co when a college counselor or a principal or a school is contacted by an organization saying, you know, do you have students who qualify or you know that they don't have a lot of applicants. So that, that's always a sign to us that definitely increase your chances here if you fill this one out. That's a great point. Um, I'll tell you guys a funny story really quickly. So I was your classic non or difficult high school student. My mom tried really hard to get me interested in these things. I was highly uncooperative. So I regret it all these years later, but at the time, uh, you know how it is. Um, and so she told me, she said, look for scholarships. And so I was dragging my heels as high school students sometimes do. And so she told me, we made a deal. She said, you get good enough grades slash test admissions test scores and I'll drop the whole scholarship thing. And um, I committed to a number and then made exactly that number. So, uh, but I regret it. And it's not just going in, it's not just scholarships when you're applying, there are scholarships all the way throughout college that you can find. Absolutely. There are scholarships that institutions uh -huh. provide. And many of those are also small or specific to certain majors, don't have a lot of applicants or aren't well known. So scholarships aren't just for applications, right? They can be done throughout uh, the time that a student's in college as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and Katie, one thing I do not help families find scholarships, that is not a service that I provide. But I do encourage my families, if your student can start putting together an essay bank, their ninth grade, they can recycle a lot of the essays and use them for various scholarships that come, you know, come to fruition. So, you know, think about having a bank of eight essays already together and then they just tweak them depending on, you know, the scholarship that they're applying for. Um, I always say if students took on getting scholarships like a part-time job, you know, it can be incredibly rewarding, but it does take time. And I think we were joking, you know, when's the last time a kid made $500 for two hours of work? So, uh, you know, again, I just think they have to be purposeful about it. I think they have to plan for it. And I do think they can be quite successful, but it is the role, in my opinion, of the student to go out and seek those scholarships in conjunction with their college counselors. Yeah, and that's a great tip. So documenting the things that you're doing all the way throughout high school so it's easier to draw on those to create essays. It's easier to keep up with and modify those for the different scholarships. That's a great tip. So um, I'm pretty sure over the last few minutes, we've gotten a few more questions coming in. We also have some more questions that we received in advance. So I like for us to shift and address some of those here. First and foremost, we have a question from Drew's watching live. So uh, Monica, this is going back to expected family contribution and assets and, and maybe even the CSS profile. So what about rental properties? You mentioned that, that that's absolutely considered for the CSS profile. Is that part of expected family contribution in general too? So if you're looking, if you have real estate property and you own it in your name, then that will be reported up on the FAFSA. If you own that real estate inside of a LLC or inside of a business, then that asset would be excluded on the FAFSA. On the CSS profile, whether you own it yourself or you own it through a, a corporation or an LLC, it will be included in the formula that they use to determine your aid eligibility. Great, thank you so much for answering that. Um, we had many questions. So we talked a lot about the expected family contribution and how school, like how FAFSA is looking at and what assets they're looking at. 
Um, so this comes up quite often, but what if a student's parents are divorced? There's questions about whose financial information should be used on the FAFSA, who qualifies for what, or how should a family go about that if um, in, in circumstances where the parents are divorced? So when you're filling out the FAFSA, they look for the custodial parent. And there's a big misunderstanding around custodial parent. So custodial parent is the parent who the child spends the majority of the time with. It has nothing to do with your tax return. So if you have equal custody between mom and dad, my recommendation is the custodial parent would be the parent with the least amount of income. Obviously, that's how we would maximize need-based financial aid. So the FAFSA will only require the custodial parent. The CSS profile will require the custodial parent and the non-custodial parent. Remember, there's a lot more information they're looking for on those CSS profiles. Now, a lot of schools are, you know, getting wise to, you know, many of these financial um, strategies that we try to employ. So some schools are now having you fill out a FAFSA, but then they'll also ask for alternative or for additional information like business assets to our gentleman's point about real estate or uh, non-custodial parent information. So that's why the collegeboard.org is a wonderful site go and research the school that your child is interested in and understand exactly what forms they're looking for. Uh, again, uh, every school is going to be different. So that's a great point. Um, what do you recommend in cases where maybe the school is seeking to get some information about the non-custodial parent, but the non-custodial parent is not expecting to contribute anything, if at all, to the student's education? Yeah, so schools don't really get in the middle of that. They expect, I mean, the reality today is that as families, you're expected to pay for college for your kids, right? There are some, ex there are some instances where you can get some need-based help. There are instances where your students are academically excelling, so they'll receive merit awards. But if you have a, a, a non-custodial parent that says, I'm not submitting my information because I just don't want to, um, that really will put your child in a very difficult position. So they want the information. They don't care what the relationships are between ex-husbands and wives. They're not getting involved in any of that. What they want to know is, you know, it, who who's involved. And if, you know, if, if the father is refusing his documents, you're going to have to report that up and, you know, the school will take that on a case by case example. That's helpful information. Um, we had some, some families also asking just for general advice for single parents. So not, not necessarily divorced, but just single parent households. Are there any best practices they can employ to make college more affordable if all the burden is on a single person? Oh, it's so hard. You know, I so empathize with all of my families. College is just outrageously expensive. It's, it's really, um, it, it, it's, it's shocking, actually. And so the thing that I would do is for single parents that are, you know, are middle class, I would really encourage you scholarships, have your students take on scholarships like a part time job, because the numbers don't lie. Here is what they're going to expect you to pay, 25% of your total income. And then they're going to look at 6% of your assets. And that's what you're expected to pay. Now, as we talked about, you can have an exceptional student and you'll earn merit awards because they want to entice your student to come. But at the end of the day, it's 25% of your income and 6% of your assets. I imagine a student in that situation who had really good grades um, and qualified for need-based, that there's a chance that that could be helpful, but still, there's, there's still a lot to think through. Absolutely. And just one other piece, you know, I, I get this all the time. Um, well, my kid's going to get a full ride scholarship. And I don't want to discourage families. My hope is really to motivate you to begin planning sooner. 
But the reality is there are so few free rides. Families, every single one will pay something for college. So beginning that planning and understanding today will help so much with your success when your students, you're making these decisions about what colleges to go to. So speaking of making decisions about colleges and what colleges you sh could, should consider, I wanna just drive home this point again. So Kate, you mentioned this at the beginning when we looked at the overall price of college and sticker shock. Um, someone did ask, should you base your college selection or the, the schools that you choose to consider based on any financial restrictions? Um, no, I don't think so because you don't know what the offers are going to be. So you shouldn't, I don't think a student should eliminate a college from their application process until they have a very good idea of, of what, you know, what that college is capable of offering. And a lot of that information is available right on the college's websites. And the students should really advocate for themselves. Um, every student is different. Every student brings something unique to that college and they can reach out. It's easier than ever now by email to reach out to the college representatives, get to know who your college uh, representative is for your region and contact that rep directly and ask the questions very directly. The college representatives want you to apply. So they're going to be very frank with you and, and they'll, um, they'll give you a good response. So, um, uh, and also, like I said, go to the meetings, go to the college fairs. Anytime the parents um, find about any information going on in the community in relation to college, they should go. The more questions they ask, the more informed they'll be about making those decisions. But they shouldn't eliminate right off the bat based on, on the sticker price. And um, always look at your, your options too, like Monica's very first slide showing the, um, the public universities are much less expensive. Um, so we advise all of our students in New York to apply to at least one SUNY, at least one CUNY, um, which are such affordable, wonderful opportunities for New Yorkers. And then in um, our neighboring state, New Jersey, Many of our students are applying to New Jersey State Colleges and they understand the SUNY system. So if a student is accepted to both, the financial aid office might try to match the SUNY price in order to get the student to come to the New Jersey State College or, or get as close as possible. We've seen that happen too. So I'm so glad you said that, Kate. We got a question from Kevin in the chat. So if you have questions and you're watching this right now, remember to use that chat pod to submit those and our team will bring them over so that we can uh, hand them off to our panelists. But how much flexibility does a college have in granting funds? Um, and so what suggestions do you have to push back or to obtain? So you mentioned briefly comparing packages. Uh, how have you seen families be successful with that? We have seen parents go after they've had um, their students have multiple acceptances and go back to the financial aid office um, with those acceptances and those offers in hand. And um, you know they've been successful at getting, at getting a little bit more money off the price of the, uh, of the overall tuition. You know, I always like to say, don't forget college is a business. <laughs> and you know, schools are looking for the families who with the best kids who have the most money and parents are looking for the best schools for the least amount of money. So you really do sit on very opposite sides of the table with the colleges. So the more you can negotiate, the more you can show schools, look, my student or I as the student have been accepted to all of these eight schools and here's my award letters. You really can't begin to negotiate and banter back and forth with the colleges and say, you know, I got this award here. I'd really love to come to this school, but how can I do that when there's such a difference in the financial aid packages? So it is a negotiation. And to be a great negotiator, you have to have a lot of those award letters showing that your student, um, you know, is wanted at several schools. That is great advice. Um, speaking of early, and being early, we've talked a lot about being early in the process. There's early decision and early acceptance. Um, do you see the same benefits all across the board on being early? Like do schools give aids on a first come first serve basis? Are there any advantages to being later in the cycle for those, those natural procrastinators out there? Uh, <laughs> so, so again, you know, there's, there's a, I think how you tackle early decision, early acceptance, um, I think if you know the school that you want to go to and your heart is set on it and you don't care what the financial package is, early decision or early action is okay. If you care about financial packages, I encourage families to wait 
because you know um, early decision is binding, right? Unless for some financial reason you can't make it, but so. I, I don't know, because I come from a financial standpoint and I'm trying to maximize um, my family's um, uh, resources, I like them to wait and negotiate um, with several letters. So I don't know, Kate, you, you might think a little differently, but uh, yeah, I think you know. It's, yeah, it depends on the family. And like you said about, about the specific college, if what becomes the most important um, factor is it acceptance into that college? Um, then you'll go early decision. But if you go early decision, you're not going to have any other offers to compare to. Mm -hmm. So parents, families, students, they need to understand that early on. And um, that's a decision you know, we've been we just talked about very recently with several of our students. November first was that early decision deadline, and then the early action you have until um, until May first to decide. So you can you can do some early action, some regular decision to have more choices. Um, it, yeah, it's different for every family um, and they have to do their research. You have to be very well informed before you decide to go early decision. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are a lot of things to consider there. So if you, um, so get yourself informed and this was a great first step in the process. So if you're watching, just give yourself a little congratulations on getting the information that you need and getting started on information that will be helpful to you in this process. Uh, while we see if there's any more questions coming in, I do want to thank those of you who joined and who've been watching. Um, I hope it's as, been as helpful for you as it's been for me. And if I'm being honest, even though I know better, I have not done enough thinking about how I'm going to put my two kids through college. So um, it always seems like there's going to be more time and there's not. So Monica, Kate, thank you for inspiring me to take action and get the ball rolling on this so that, because um, as you, you made that point, if you start in fifth grade, imagine how much better that's going to feel than starting later on. Um, I do have a little bit of time of a kindergartner and a third grader, but I know how time flies and it goes so fast. Oh, yes. so fast. Yeah. We yes. just sent our, um, our oldest daughter to college last year. She's a sophomore now and I have one who's a senior in high school. So she's awaiting um, decisions and it feels like just yesterday when we made our first, um, deposit into the 529 and my husband and I said 18 years of saving and it, it's pretty fast how, how you write those checks <laughs> all those years. right oh I'm not ready um I'm not yes ready. you are <laughs> uh, so we did get a question from Janelle that came in about receiving scholarships uh so how do scholarships does that impact the amount that the family is expected to contribute does that impact uh, do you have to report those on your FAFSA? Like what is, does scholarship money impact the cost of college on the front end or only on the back end? So I do think it's very school specific, but if we were to make a, a generalization, the scholarships that students receive do not reduce the family's expected family contribution. They, re they reduce the school's contribution. So that doesn't mean that you can't call and say, look, my kid did all this work and so you can't penalize them. Again, there's, there should be a lot of dialogue and discussion going on, but just at first blush, scholarships will come off of the school's portion, not the family's portion. Great, thank you for clarifying that, Monica. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight, for being here tonight and sharing your expertise and experience with us. It's um, incredibly helpful and we love making this information more accessible to families. We know how important that is. And we've talked about being early, being well-informed and making sure that you have what you need. So if you have specific questions for Monica, we wanna put her contact information up. Um, you can visit her website. So take a screen grab, but as we mentioned before, all this will be recorded so you can access it anytime if you need to find it. You can also call our office directly. Um, if your child does need a stronger test score to be eligible for some of the merit-based aids, we've talked about good grades and we've talked about strong test scores as some qualifying factors for merit aid. Uh, we encourage you to participate in our free national practice test weekend coming up November 18th and 19th. So you can register with the link on this slide right here. It's captest.com forward slash practice test weekend. And it's a great, again, a free opportunity for you to get a sense of which test might be the best fit, which test your child may be more likely to uh, do well on. And then you can make some, again, more informed decisions about what that means for a family. And um, as you consider that part of the financial planning process. 
And then don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and or Twitter for more information. We share routinely and we'll share back out some of the best clips from this series uh, as well as others that we've talked about. So let us know how we can help you find more information. And again, thank you to our amazing panelists tonight, Monica and Kate. We appreciate you spending your time with us and making some great information more accessible to our families out there. Thanks. Thank you. All right, then that's it from us. I hope you all have a great night. Good night. Good night.